because I just learned something new. And this is like this. If you do like this in um, a space like, like this or in a conference, so you ask for clarification. Um, because you, you, you might have noticed that we are pretty international tonight, right? With people from New Zealand and France and the US and uh, Great Britain, all over the world, actually. Because we do something we call deep dive on fair share for the commons. That's the issue we're working about in these days. And um, so I learned, and in this deep dive, I learned to do this. And I wonder how many of you got that idea of the README files as a new legal form for the comments? Did you raise your hand? Great, that's four people. That's not too bad. So might you re-explain me that? If I, if I got it right, what David says, that that idea of um, reinventing law for the comments at least has a double function, which is, first of all, rooting it in social practices, right? reconnecting it to what we actually need. And secondly, as, as the Carter of the Foreign State put limitations to privatization. This happened 800 years ago for the first time. And so how do the readme files, whatever that is, um, cope with both issues? One, two, three, yes. Uh, well, actually, you caught me on the one thing that I actually don't know. Because li oh. listen to this, listen to this. I found out about the README files two days ago from somebody in Berlin who's called Lars Zimmerman. And he's a. Is he here? Is he here, Lars? And he Nestle. wrote an, an interesting article called the Institutions of Open Source. And he mentioned the README file. I've seen it on GitHub and stuff. I never open it because I'm not a tech guy. Uh, but, you know, so the, the thing is that. Maybe to partially answer your answer, partially answer your question is that uh, these rules and norms are contextual, as you said. They're contextual to particular projects who have to 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 solve particular problems. And so we are in a state of emergence, where these many communities are inventing, reinventing, finding solutions, experimenting solutions. But we don't stay there. If you look at Ostrom, you know, she will say on the one hand that every physical resource, every physical commons, every physical community is different. Not even you know, a forest commons or an irrigation commons is the same. But she also found out that there were eight principles. Elena Ostrom, were, who yes. got the Nobel Prize for Economy in 2009 for her research on the commons, right? right. She also found that there were eight common principles to the governance of these communities. So there's always diversity, but there's also commonality. Now, I think that one of the things that David has done is actually looking at commonality by already mapping out 10 different fields uh, of emergence of this uh, new commons law. But yes, I, well, I'll answer that. I just wanted to elaborate on the README as well. I think the README files tend to be uh, community annotations of what is intended by the code, you might say a legislative history. So I think to that extent we can situate it within the, the law of the commons. But yeah, and if, if one of the four who know about README files want to add to these explanations, so you are um, invited because right now we open the floor, it's, it's your turn. Please um, share with us your ideas, your comments, your questions. And uh, the idea is not just to have a question and answer section, right, but, but really share your ideas and to deeper explore um, this issue. There will be a mic yeah, with you. The mic is with you. So yeah, just, just raise your hand so that we can see who wants to speak. And just say two words of where you come from and who you are, please. Get up. Yeah, just for clarification, we anyway need a mic for the translation, right? So it we should make sure it really works. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Alana from New Zealand, from Inspiral. 
I, I had a question for David when you were talking about the history of the Magna Carta. I was just thinking about how, uh, like right now in New Zealand, we have what's called the Waitangi Tribunal, which is uh, where uh, disputes between uh, Maori indigenous people and the crown over public assets because um, our founding document as a country in New Zealand is agreement between uh, a whole lot of uh, Maori tribes and the crown uh, about uh, shared ownership of the land, including or resources, including the land and the short foreshore and the radio frequencies and everything. I think, well, that's a really interesting question in terms of the commons as well. But it just occurred to me that it's the Waitangi Tribunal is versus the crown. Like, is it now that the crown is the way that we say the commons? <laughs> and how did that happen? And uh, why? I, is there ever uh, the, the actually the people then in these legal systems represented in these disputes? We, we can take more. Yeah. It's over there. Ah, yeah, yeah, go. Great. Ich habe eine Frage auf Deutsch. Ähm, ich frage mich, ob ähm, die Magna Carta so ein großer Fortschritt ist. Natürlich, es waren dies, die erste Niederschrift solcher Rechte, aber wie kamen die Rechte zustande? Ich mache es jetzt etwas grob. Ich nehme dir deinen Wald weg und gebe dir gewisse Rechte in diesem Wald zurück. Etwas, was 100 Jahre niemand vorher hätte kodifizieren müssen. Es ist dann auch kein Zufall, dass die Engländer nach Indien kamen und dachten, alles äh, Almendeland, alle Commons, müssten Eigentum des Königs sein, weil sie sich nichts anderes mehr vorstellen konnten. Ferdinand Jens, Berlin, ich frage mich und damit auch euch oder Sie, ist es nicht eine Ironie der Weltgeschichte, dass 800 Jahre nach der Magna Carta wir durch Verträge wie CETA, TTIP und so weiter ähm, am dem gleichen Stand stehen wie damals, nur dass jetzt nicht der König ist, sondern dass wir das privaten Großunternehmen äh, bieten und denen es eigentlich wegnehmen müssten. Also bräuchte man eine neue Magna Carta oder sollten wir diese Verträge möglicherweise auch gar nicht unterschreiben oder die, die sie unterschreiben wollen, daran hindern. Denn wir wissen, dass 500 private äh, Lobbyisten an diesen Gesprächen teilnehmen, von denen sind 90 Prozent Vertreter der äh, Großindustrie. Okay, we take one more and then we go back to the panel. There was See it very well. Who was first? Doesn't matter, right? You have another round anyway. Thank you. My name is Marin Böker and I'm in several NGOs, but as well as social entrepreneur, I have a consultancy on human rights and gender issues. My question is at the beginning, um, the same tendency to request the importance or the justice of the Magna Carta because uh, you missed out that um, the rights of the cities and Magna Carta, Carta was for citizens. Who was a citizen? It was a he, not a she. And uh, I remember that the Jewish people were not allowed to live inside the wall, but outside the wall. And there were other minorities. So is the challenge of today, if we think for the future, not to create an inclusive law and inclusive sharing, uh, which is not the normality. I mean, there is a hard fight about this. Um, if we are honest and start from here, I agree that this is a very good way for the future. The second uh, point is that um, I th uh, are you talking about uh, creating new law because um, w then you need punishments? Because uh, I like the idea there's no commercialization, but how? I mean, how can you stop anybody to do this? So there must be a punishment. And uh, I'm working a lot with human rights uh, treaty bodies and treaties. And is it a kind of vision to create a new um, human rights treaty about something like this? Because I think in Latin America and Africa, we could have a lot of partners. Here in Europe, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think a lot of these questions center on uh, the power of the state to be an adequate protector of commonwealth, and especially the, the New Zealand question and the other gen and the gentleman's question 
uh, the state has often claimed for itself the authority to be the guarantor and protector of this shared wealth. And we've seen in many, many instances, it has simply betrayed that trust. It has not been a conscientious, rigorous trustee of the commonwealth. And I think what a lot of commoners are saying is we ought to have more direct control or the state should not have such exclusive, sweeping, comprehensive uh, authority to be the guardian of, of the public wealth. And in New Zealand, for example, the, the way that the state law has come into conflict with indigenous people's law, which is arguably more uh, respectful and integrated with ecosystems as a living way of life, rather than something that's quite distant and oriented towards market extraction, and of course, to, uh, harm and destruction of ecological things. So in some ways, we're talking about a struggle, which is the more legitimate body of authority to manage our shared wealth? And as for the question on human rights, similarly, we've reached limits on what the nation state and international treaty organizations can or will do to protect human rights. And I think some of this authority ought to devolve to smaller levels and be more socially integrated as a way with, I'm not saying either or, but new uh, balances of ways of achieving human rights. I think within certain um, commoning communities, human rights may be more fulfilled by meeting people's everyday needs in a non-market way than the market state is doing because we've seen so much deprivation or uh, lack of concern for human rights through, through that system. So I think we need some innovation in types of law, and I don't simply mean uh, a written document necessarily. It means a social practice that helps uh, fulfill the, the law, and that's what I think the commons can contribute to this, this conversation. No, I, I just want to confirm what, what uh, one of the gentlemen said is that, uh, you know, a lot of this commons law only is generated when there are issues and when there are conflicts, right? As long as things go fairly well, nothing is written down. And if you look at the origin of the general public license, which is like, you know, the basic constitution of open source communities, it was clearly created as a reaction to new enclosures because science until that time was considered an open commons. And it only got, uh, you know, more and more enclosed in the 70s. And I remember the story of Richard Stallman that he, you know, used to repair his copy machine. Richard Stallman, right? who is the, the, founder the founder of the Free Software, Software Foundation, Foundation and of the, of the general public license. It's only because one day somebody told him, oh no, there is a, there is a, copy, a, a copywriter a patent on this printing machine, you can't touch it. You know, that's when the need was felt for these copyright, uh, these copyleft licenses, right, as a reaction to protect the commons. And I think it's entirely correct to say that before the forest of the, the chart of the commons, the commons was not as much under threat as when that had to be uh, enforced. Um, I, want to, I wanted to give another example, if my brain uh, cooperates, uh, but I think it doesn't. Okay, so we'll, we'll wait for that. As for this, you mentioned the sanction questions. I think many common, if, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, the uh, political scientist who won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her study of commons, one of her eight principles was that any successful, uh, durable commons has a means for identifying free riders or people who harm the, the commonwealth or the community in ways of sanctioning them, usually in a graduated way. And the reason it's graduated is so that the relationships can be preserved. But the point is that the community is more organically connected to that whole uh, enforcement of sanctions, and it's not a formal legalistic thing in which people who perhaps are not part of that community or don't know it well, in all sorts of arcane ways that we don't understand, will resolve justice. Whereas social communities, um, they have their own limitations in terms of uh, what we would consider due process. On the other hand, they also are the basis for certain uh, moral norms and authority, which I'm not sure I respect the authority of certain courts that uh, expert lawyers and wealthy, uh, wealthy uh, defendants can dominate. So 
I think you talk, as for sanctions, I think there is room for these types of community-driven sanctions to help uh, enforce better than the nation state or judicial, judicial systems can. I guess that there are people in the room who might contribute to that CETA TTIP question, right? So I want to invite you to, to help us out with this as well. Uh, where's the mic? Is here David? And then you? Yeah, please. Yes. I'm David Hammerstein of the Commons Network, which is a new European NGO. It's working on a lot of these issues. I'm based in Brussels. Over the last five or ten years, we've seen some successes in overcoming the chasm, the tremendous rift between social practice and the, legitis the legitimacy of laws. In one area has been an area of culture, of an immaterial um, knowledge, especially in the scientific area, the academic world. We've seen an academic spring rejecting the enclosure of publicly financed academic knowledge in enclosed journals, for example. We've seen the rejection of new licensing schemes to enclose um, text and data mining. Now this, I think, is going to become with an exception of copyright. We've seen areas of human rights to break enclosure, for example, for blind people gaining an international treaty for an exception to copyright so blind people around the world can share their materials and text, which, by the way, is supported by the vast majority of European countries. But Germany and the Justice Ministry under SPD is blocking it because of the pressure of the publishers. So blind people all around the world, millions of them, cannot have access to Braille and digital works because of this fundamentalist position by the in the blocking majority in the European Union by the German Justice Ministry. But anyways, what I'm saying is that the immaterial world or the non-rivalrous, the elements that are not rivalrous, I think there is space for moving that, but we're kind of in a contradiction. The people doing that on the ground, creating the commons on the ground, have kind of a suspicion and it's kind of contradictory for them to take part in legal political battles on a higher level. So I think the idea of the assembly of the commons, the chamber of the commons is very relevant. Now, my, set, my real question I'm gonna, is on a totally different sphere, which is in the material sphere, which is in the sphere of nature. For example, right now, we're going into the COPE on climate change, which has also a lot to do with the material commons, but a lot to do with the material commons. Nevertheless, nature and things, I have a problem explaining this when I talk about commoners. It seems they think, oh, well, you're very um, naive. You think that people getting together in communities are naturally going to defend um, nature and things. And if we read Bruno Latour, we see he has a whole new political structure of a parliament of microbes and things and scientific world with mediation of human beings to give a voice to the natural world. And I don't think it's naturally a given. And sometimes we see local communities who democratically decide to deplete nature. And it's happened over the last thousands of years. So I think Obviously, we need to be guided by principles, but also my question is, how could we also overcome the dualism between the natural world, um, the living world, things, microbes, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of the cave we live in, the social cave we live in, that hasn't taken that account. We, so we have a, a real cultural enclosure as well in social that doesn't take into account the natural world. And I think we could see this in what's happening all around us. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Matthias Hayden. Um, I think my question or comment kind of relates to this. Um, it's also about the material world, because um, I'm not in the digital world so much. Um, I really try to avoid it as much as I can, and I'm pretty much, besides being an architect and a planner, uh, a city activist, and so my work is pretty much about the urban commons. And um, I just read a book um, by David Harvey, which is called Rebel City, and his chapter, Urban Commons, where he's criticizing, but he's acknowledging um, Ostrom's work, but he's also criticizing it insofar that he's saying that her research is predominantly all the cases she makes, if, he, if I can believe him, what he's saying is all the cases she makes predominantly are small-scale cases. And the problem starts if you leave the neighborhood, um, and as soon as you hit the city space, like Berlin, a city of 3.5 million inhabitants, uh, and then the region and the state and beyond, then you have a problem and you will not get along with 
that kind of commoning which Ostrom describes. And so he's arguing that we need to reinvent not only or bring back the notion or the theory and the practices of the commoning, which is pretty much about a social practice on the ground in terms of getting rid of law, but bringing back, um, no, getting rid of the legal, but making more important the legitimate, right? I mean, I totally, I'm, I experienced this in 30 years in the squatter movement and neighborhoods movement. I mean, there you can get along without written words, right? If you meet everybody once in a while. But how do you come to agreements to uh, rules and regulations, so to say, which are not based on law, but on legitimacy? And um, so, and I think belief systems, value systems might be, um, you know, to imagine another, you know, another world is possible. I mean, we have have that since 20 years. Um, but I think it's more complicated. It also needs a systems analysis and basically an analysis and then very precise suggestions how to bring, to organize that systems change. And I bring you one example, and here I come to my question. Now we have um, one very prominent housing initi initiative in a former public housing estate. Um, it's called Cotty and Co. And they're challenging um, the city government in terms of um, how they sold out um, half of the public housing stock in Berlin. And now um, big, big hedge funds are exploiting that situation um, to the worst. And they're basically challenging the city government for to re-communalize, you know, to make it to re to make it public again. Um, and they're quite successful. We just um, have a process of a, a referendum, which is also being driven by that group. But they also are quite doubtful, um, even maybe fearful, what would happen if those public, formerly public housing estates would become public again. Because they would not like to have it organized as it was organized by social democracy and all that along going kind of management. So they are also thinking about how to reorganize a future public housing in the sense of the commoning. And then you're not, you're not talking about, um, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of homes. Um, so what are your ideas on that, on that level, on that scale? Um, I, it's, it's my, my main question is a matter of scale. You know? so or, and, then, and then we open the third and last round. So there will still be some time. And my name is Molina Gosch. I'm from Berlin. And I wanted to ask something about protecting the commons. Uh, I wanted to know if you have already heard about the term earth rights. And so, because now, like global change and everything that's going on, maybe it's time that we give the earth um, the right to live and that we don't see it as a dead thing anymore, but as a living body that needs protection with earth rights. Hopefully, uh, my name is Thomas, uh, WeShare Connector. Um, I have maybe hopefully a short question to Michelle or everybody who can answer it, because you mentioned the uh, platform cooperatives. Uh, do you have some good example of European or German? I'm just trying to research, but I can't really find very much uh, yet. And uh, because that would be a practical, like the, like uh, in, instead of Airbnb and Uber, or maybe like as the next step. But I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you have some good examples beyond Fairmondo or some other platforms? I need to admit that in this round, it is really hard for me to shut up and take my role as a moderator. David? Well, I'd like to invite our esteemed moderator to, uh, to chime in on some of these, because these are very, uh, uh, very difficult questions, uh, especially the ones on scale. A and I think that uh, there's two answers. The, the two environmental questions, are, I think, are related, which is you know, people are talking about rights for the Earth, and I think that's an important direction, uh, albeit within the existing legal system. I think ultimately we need to get to a place of relationality, genuine re relational, meaning our cultural relations, our social practices, and our identity are more connected with our physical places, our localities, our ecosystems, our cities. And it's about the human affect having a connection with the resource instead of the resource, you know, I being here, the resource there. Uh, and so the commons is essentially about reestablishing relationality 
in finding ways for the in the appro in the appropriate scales. Now, I think the criticism that the Ostrom world of commons are only of a certain scale and they they can't go larger. I think we haven't resolved that issue yet because the internet has providing very interesting ways to federate small scales or even take them larger than we could imagine. I'm fascinated, for example, by the this thing called the system for rice intensification, which is this global network of, of rice farmers who have traded uh, agronomy practices for improving yields on rice, have improved yields three, four, five times normal rates. Now, admittedly, it's more of an information commons than a physical resource commons. Nonetheless, one can imagine within a certain bioregion uh, federations of smaller scale commons that collaborate in assembly of commons types ways. Uh, th this obviously has not, it's a, uh, a future challenge in the sense we don't even have many, the density of such commons. But you raise a very important question, David Harvey raises an important question about scale, but I think it's not just scale in the bottom to top hierarchical way, but the federating out. Uh, and this is a cultural thing, uh, as opposed to a legal or a political thing or a uh, construct institutional construction thing. So I think it's something that will emerge. I, at least I, that's my aspiration and hope. We don't know. Uh, so yes, for Earth rights, Bolivia and Ecuador have, have formally uh, embarked upon that path. I'm not sure it's the final answer, but for now it's certainly an advance of consciousness raising uh, and maybe a way station to a better way of finding ways for law and social practice of commoning to respect ecosystems. I, I just wanted to say that actually the role of the digital is about scaling, right? I mean, so uh, last week I was in Paris, uh, it's a castle 80 miles from Paris, where there's a project called POC 21, Proof of Concept 21, and it's 12 sustainable manufacturing projects you know, it's all very physical. These are people making open source farm toolkits. As you may know today, if you buy a tractor in the US, you don't buy the tractor, you buy the software. You're forbidden to repair the tractor because that means interfering with the copyrighted software that runs a tractor. So farming communities are creating their own machines now in, in communities like FarmHack, Slow Tools Project, Atelier Paysan. I'm not sure they exist in Germany, but I believe they probably do. Uh, so their their people are using the digital. It's not because they are immaterial. It's it's to scale. So if you have one sustainable manufacturing solution, the only way to scale it is to connect with similar communities across the world. So it's entirely physical, and the digital is the organizing tool. I I recently read uh, not a book but a review of the book. It's uh, the title is I'm not correct, but it's in, you can find it on Google. It's poor to poor, peer to peer. And it's a book about, not digital nomads, but about a, a whole underground economy in Europe that almost nobody knows about. Uh, and this is that these are huge streams of trans migrants that come six months to Europe to sell electronics to the poor communities in Europe. And they use the internet to negotiate prices, to tell people where they are because they only appear like one day in a particular place and they have the latest technology in China. And so all the poor migrants, uh, you know, go there to that particular place and then they have access at very cheap prices of this very high tech. So this is entirely done informally at scale, at an enormous scale using networks. Um, I would also suggest things like, you know, these global open design communities, they scale. Uh, the Linux Foundation, the Wikimedia Foundation, they're example of scaling which we can learn from. Uh, you know, they have, so one of the ways in which they work is through protocols, right? For, remember Occupy. Now Occupy is maybe not a good example because it didn't last, but it was able to mobilize millions of people in a very short period of time and it lasted several weeks. And the way they did was by using protocols, uh, shared protocols, which if you follow certain rules, you can call yourself Occupy, right? Uh, now, in, in open source communities, this is maintained through these foundations, which Occupy did not have. Uh, so I think, yes, I'm, I'm not saying I have the solutions, but I'm just saying that 
people are experimenting with solutions for scaling and in such a way that um, the small group dynamics can be preserved because I think this is the big worry if we have to uh, scale that we you know go into hierarchy now we have here uh, Christian Yayone who's, who's here just uh, who's been innovating uh, in Italy with governance uh, systems for the commons uh, there's the Bologna regulation for the care and regeneration of the urban commons uh, which is a whole new way of conceiving about the public service not as a as an enabling mechanism for autonomous civic action right in in bologna you can correct me if i'm wrong citizens collective neighborhood collectives can propose ways to improve their neighborhoods there's an evaluation mechanism and then there's a negotiation between the city and the collectives about how the city can help the citizens realize these projects so it's so there's a lot of innovation um, in italy around public commons partnerships and the commonification of public services, which I think we have a lot to learn from. So the problem is I think that these things are happening and we don't know about it. I mean, that's for me the issue is that we don't yet have a press and media that can scale up the knowledge of these experiences. And so uh, I think we, we need to really look at that and, and learn from each other. Last round, you start here and where's the mic? Here we have the lady here in the second row to start with and then somebody here in the last row. Hi, um, I'm Elise, I'm French and so I'm pessimistic, it's in my DNA. Um, I see a problem which is that I fear that people have been dispossessed of this capability of creating and I think the people who are now active in the open source community are a few, a really a few type of population. And I don't really see the scaling up happening, even if we have the medium to do it, because of the culture in the people. That's my question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Op Jelok, ich bin aus Berlin um, und um, ich ich befasse mich auch schon länger mit dieser Thematik aus, aus meinem eigenen Interesse heraus. Ähm, was äh, ein kleiner Hinweis vielleicht vorab oder auch als Frage gedacht. Ähm, es, ähm, es war ja die Frage äh, im Raume gewesen vorhin, ähm, wie sozusagen solche Rechte ähm, vertraglich gesichert werden können, was die Commons angeht. Und da gibt es ja jetzt einen aktuellen Fall, den kann der Herr aus den USA vielleicht besser beurteilen wo eine ähm, Gemeinde in den USA gegen die äh, Wasserprivatisierung ihres eigenen Brunnens klagt, und zwar aufgrund ihrer verfassungsrechtlich gesicherten Rechte. Wenn ihm das nicht bekannt ist, das war eine Dokumentation im Fernsehen darüber, und da war sozusagen äh, Nestle, glaube ich, oder jedenfalls ein Großkonzern, der wollte dieses Wasser für seine Zwecke benutzen, also privatisieren, was eigentlich ein öffentliches Gut ist und auch rechtlich dieser Gemeinde von der Verfassung zugesichert war. Es war ein langer Prozess im Gange deshalb und jetzt ist es eben irgendwann hochgekocht und in den USA vor dem Verfassungsgericht gelandet. Das ist nur eine Schiene, wo man mal zeigen kann, wie sich auch solches Recht vielleicht in einer anderen Form sichern lässt. Ein anderer Hinweis, was diese, diese Ausrichtung allein auf die Rechte angeht. Ich denke, wenn man mehr für die Commons tun will in der Welt, auch mit diesen Skalierungsproblemen, dann sollte man einmal äh, ökonomisch über Rahmenbedingungen nachdenken, ähm, die sozusagen sowas sichern und auf der anderen Seite auch über rechtliche ähm, Rahmensetzungen weltweit. Also es gibt ja ähm, den sogenannten Weltmarkt mit seinen Welthandelsstandards und genauso muss man diese Dinge eben auch weltweit rechtlich dann absichern, sei es über die UNO oder andere äh, Organisationen, die dort also rechtsetzend denn sind, 
Beispiel, wie es auch ein Weltsicherheitsrat gibt, so gibt es eben auch ein Weltgericht und so weiter. Und dieses muss natürlich dann auch, darf natürlich nicht missbrauchbar sein denn für bestimmte Machteliten, sondern das muss dann auch durchaus demokratisch dann gewählt werden und auch kontrolliert werden. Gut, also als Anregung. So we take Heiner and then you, the lady, as the last one for tonight, okay? Thinking. I'm in the Global Commons Alliance in ECOSOC and I'm very enthused about the discussions because we are think we are doing here an interesting step, talking about scale. And in the early days of discussion of scale, it was said scale is more than size. It has proportions and consequences. And with, when discussing with Eleanor maybe 15 years ago, she were, was aware of that. She was looking into utilities of very large towns like LA. She was really looking what we call 25 years ago global to really bridge what UNESCO calls tangible and intangible knowledge. So when we go to the scales, proportions, consequences, then we should be very much aware that these cultural commons are holding us and binding us together. So I think when we follow up on that track, like we try now with the SDG discussions in New York, to really see what our inner commons, and it's not only what we can eat. Hi. My name's uh, Mary Meller from Great Britain. And my area of interest is in the um, recognition and transfer of value. And uh, I've been particularly interested in the socialization of money and the democratization of money. And it seems to me that the secret capitalism had and the way it got going was it issued credit to itself ahead of its production. And it seems to me that if you want to grow in scale, what you're going to have to do is invent a means of value or, 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 or co capture the ordinary public value, that is the public currency, into your social networks so that you create credit ahead of the activity. Because that's the way capitalism grew. And I think the social sector's got to grow in the same way. Who wants to ask? Well, the last comment we could speak all evening, and I think it's a fascinating, provocative question. Uh, you can actually do. There will be an opportunity <laughs> to do so. Yeah, no problem. Let me, I'll just bracket and let Michelle, who's more knowledgeable about uh, alternative currency, speak to that. But I agree with that basic sentiment that we need alternative units, currencies of value for, for commons uh, to begin to be able to not simply be hostage to the prevailing financial system and money systems. Um, I will leave it at that. Should I just speak to these other, the other questions then? Um, I agree that we have, you know, culture is a very difficult thing to change, but I think we, the history of open source software or the idea of open source as a cultural meme has been phenomenally powerful, going into all sorts of different realms of life beyond software or even the digital realm. And I think because it appeals to a fundamental notion of participation and fairness and access. So you know, I think this is a long-term struggle, you know, but I think that the precedence of, of the open source way of doing things uh, are itself a kind of a cultural uh, uh, lever or fulcrum that we can build on. Uh, but you're right, there's a lot of reactionary or inert cultural areas that are just very difficult to penetrate. I, I think it is a long-term struggle. As for the, the gentleman's question about uh, the community owning the water, I'd like, I don't know the specific case you're referring to, but traditionally the state has sovereign control over these resources and historically the state often just colludes with the market to give it away. And for the community to have the legal entitlement to protect that, especially against the federal or interstate commerce, uh, federal government or interstate commerce, is exceedingly rare and certainly not a constitutional right. The only thing I can think of is the public tr trust doctrine, which is a very ancient doctrine which says the state cannot 
take away or give away that which belongs to the public. Uh, it has to protect it. So that may be one source for protecting this water, but in general, communities don't have many legal entitlements uh, to protect their, their water or other resources, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I want to address the French pessimism, maybe. Um, I just saw a video yesterday with ben Benoit Poulvo, who is a Belgian uh, uh, cineast, and he was saying when he makes a movie in France and there's a car in the way, you know, there's a whole chain of command uh, shouting, why is there a car in the way? Why is there a car in the way? And it goes down to the, you know, the last person. And then nothing happens where in Belgium they just move the car. Uh, so that's, I think, particular, you know, to the Jacobin tradition is uh, this very strong idea in France that things have to come uh, from the state and from above and that uh, this empowers people. But it's also because it's why you, it's exactly why you have revolutions in France. And I just recall that the day before May 68, uh, what was his name, Bertrand uh, Delpech or something, he wrote, France is bored. And the next day, Paris was on fire. Um, but anyway, so I just want to say that, um, you know, it's the engagement, I think, from minorities which creates a change first. And the thing is, when you create a commons, this is my experience, you love what you do and you cannot help but become optimistic because you love what you do and and hopefully and that's also of course the hope is that it's it it's like a contagion that when people see that you're changing and that you know you're creating a new life and new livelihoods that they will become inspired somehow to do the same um, and i don't think we need the whole population to change as various calculation i've seen for example in the consumption world two percent of the consumers can change a whole industry. There are several studies showing that. And you think about the Renaissance, you know, a few thousand people changed the whole character of Europe. Um, so I don't think we should be pessimistic. I think we, we have a duty to, to be optimistic, not because we're sure we will win, but because it's the only way to mobilize our energy. We should certainly not be optimistic, but doing everything to really connect the dots. I, I have the feeling that I, I find it pretty often that people say, I come more from the natural commons or the urban commons or whatever, and I'm not really knowledgeable about the digital and the cultural commons, etc. And we just shared an example this morning in the train when coming here that just imagine you want to do something like the degrowth movement. It's all about reuse and uh, co-using and stuff and doing modular things. So in order to make them really sustaining for years and using them for years instead of plant obsolescence thing, etc. Just imagine they now use copyright law or the so-called um, IP, in intellectual property law, to forbid this, to forbid reuse and repair. And that's what's coming. So just you, so you make the connection of how we need to deal with the knowledge commons if we want to federate all the commons all over in the world, which are pretty many. And I'm, I'm really happy to have here in the room commoners from all over the world. One quick last comment on um, the idea of um, public and, 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 and comments, and also the idea of scaling. It seems to me that sometimes the doubt that we cannot scale is based on a wrong notion of the commons, or on a limited notion on the commons, of the commons, so to say. When I started doing my, my first book on the issue, it was in Spanish, and was then translated into, into German, which was called Who Owns the World? It was very much based on that idea that there's a common pool resource, you know, and we need to manage it collectively. So very much Ostrom style. And then we moved on doing this anthology, and, and we learned when closing the book, you want to do a new one because you didn't get it right. Yeah, that, that's what happens. And, and so we did a new one where we really conceived the commons as a whole set of institutions that it's not only about a limited amount of resources. Actually, there's no thing in the world you cannot convert into a commons. So the commons don't fall from the sky, nor are they limited to a specific set of resources. You, we make them and we can make everything a commons. Okay, so we went on with that. And then the question is, how do you do that? So it's like the key notion of the next book when we close this one, 
when we closed this one, which is called Commons, we realized that, in fact, at the very heart of the issue is this, commoning. So we need to, to do a book on commoning. While we were working on the book on commoning, it's not yet out, we already realized that's not deep enough. We need to go a level deeper. No, it's, that's written it. It's, it's not as if these are wrong. It's like new, not enough. new, new questions yeah. and insights emerge. Yeah, <laughs> and then, so we went to the ontological level and the epistemological level. What I want to wanna point to here and just relate back to the title of our wonderful evening tonight is why do we still celebrate Magna Carta, Klaus? You asked that question, right? Because at least it still had the notion of the commons clearly enshrined. If you look at today's laws, there's something called like commonwealth. There's not even an idea, a concept, and the notion of the commons anymore in modern law. So that's the challenge. Thank you so much. Have fun chatting outdoors.